Welcome to this session. Um, my name is John Linford. I work for NVIDIA. And I'm going to talk about how to maximize high performance computing productivity, performance, and portability using something called the NVIDIA HPC SDK. And of course, all of, the, all of this is going to be on uh, AWS. We're using e EC2 primarily here. Um, I have an hour for this talk. I might use a whole hour. I might use a little less. So um, hopefully you have a lot of interest and a lot of questions. Um, do please save your questions for the end. I'm told we should wait for the end for questions. Um, but keep them in mind. Let's have a discussion. Um, I am a technical product manager for CPU software at NVIDIA. And that means that mostly my job is to run out in front of people and find all the sharp edges before your average user does. So a lot of what I'm going to show you today is actually my, my own work. So if you have any questions about this, I hopefully will be able to add, answer them. If, if not, I forgot. I'm sorry. So I'm going to start with an introduction to the NVIDIA platform. A lot of people think of NVIDIA as a GPU company. But actually, there's a lot more to NVIDIA than, than GPUs. Uh, we have CPUs. We have DPUs, we have software, and I'm going to cover all of that briefly. And then I'm going to focus on one of our SDKs. This is the NVIDIA HPC SDK, which is a sort of all-in-one solution for building high-performance computing applications and running them on lots of different kinds of hardware. That makes it really appropriate for AWS. This unlocks a lot of different instance types for your application, and I'll show you exactly how that works. The HPC SDK includes a very powerful and performant standards compliant compilers. Uh, and it enables programming models that facilitate both performance and portability across different hardware types. So it's a great starting point if you're not really sure how to map your application to your hardware. Program to the SDK instead. And I'll also take you on a brief tour of some of the high performance math libraries that come with the HPC SDK. These are really, really effective if you're doing high performance computing, scientific computing in the cloud. And finally, I'll give you a demonstration of this thing actually running on EC2. When I say demonstration, it's, it's canned. Um, I'm not going to do anything live here. But I, I did actually do this stuff. This is real results. So the NVIDIA platform. NVIDIA makes some of the best hardware ever. And on top of that hardware, after we integrate CPUs and GPUs and DPUs into this tightly coupled, amazing platform, we build an ecosystem of software on top of it, frameworks, libraries, tools, and applications, so that the whole solution is built from the ground up. And then NVIDIA is the only company I know that does this. They take that hugely integrated, perfectly crafted solution, and they break it up and let everybody pick the pieces they want. And this actually works really well, because you can take those highly optimized pieces and you can position them perfectly for what you need to achieve. And I don't have time to go through all the corners of this today, so I'm going to focus mostly on the software side of this picture. And the software side of NVIDIA is enormous. We are a software company, absolutely, with over 3 million developers, last time I checked, and over 8,000 startups working with our developer ecosystem. We have something like 500, over 500 GitLab projects, excuse me, GitHub projects, uh, at least 60 accelerated GPU SDKs, and 50, over 50 developer libraries. I mean, the ecosystem for NVIDIA, uh, the, the NVIDIA platform is, is just enormous, and it spans every area of computing. In fact, if I were to go through every part of that ecosystem, uh, I wouldn't be able to touch it in an hour. We'd, we'd, take, we'd be here for a whole week, and we'd call that NVIDIA GTC. So this, I'm just going to focus on one corner of the ecosystem today, the HPC, the high performance computing corner of the NVIDIA software ecosystem. Now, within HPC, NVIDIA has a lot of initiatives. We, of course, have our accelerated computing initiatives and taking advantage of all the power and energy efficiency of things like GPUs and the tight integration of CPUs and GPUs. You may have seen something called NVIDIA Grace and Grace Hopper. This is where we're advancing the state of the art in CPU, GPU platforms. And of course, we scale out these solutions to large multi-GPU nodes, and then take those and build those into enormous, tightly integrated uh, multi-node systems with the libraries and the software to program them. But NVIDIA also looks into the future to things like quantum computing. And there's a huge quantum effort in NVIDIA. I don't have time to touch on it today, but it's really fascinating stuff. ARM CPU is a little bit closer into the future. We are building compilers, libraries, tools, and indeed a huge software ecosystem for ARM CPUs. And that includes the AWS Graviton. Graviton 2 and Graviton 3 are supported platforms 
from the NVIDIA perspective. In fact, the AWS Graviton 3 shares a lot of design similarities with our own Grace CPU, and much of the software that I'll show you today has already been ported and tuned for Graviton 3 in preparation for Grace. So there's some advantages here. Again, looking at just this, the HPC corner of this ecosystem, there's more here than I could cover in an hour. The high-performance computing applications ecosystem at NVIDIA spans simula simulation, modeling and simulation, uh, spans data analytics at extreme scales, and training and inference, of course, for artificial intelligence, deep learning, all that stuff. I don't have time to cover it all. So I'm gonna to focus today on just one part of this, the HPC SDK, which really is a tool for modeling and simulation primarily, but it can be found in a large number of applications, not the least on-prem or on-cloud. And it is really a great tool for optimizing application performance, productivity, and portability, especially in a cloud environment. The HPC SDK comprises programming uh, models, compilers that implement those models, libraries, and accelerated math libraries, all together in a single integrated software solution. The goal here is to provide an out-of-box, single you know, go-to, one-stop shop for scientific computing uh, source developers. So your scientists and engineers, they just pick this up, they get to work. If you have existing code, you can always use the same tools to compile and run that application. Or if you're developing new code, there's a lot of advanced features that come to the HPC SDK well before they meet other compilers, as you'll see in a moment. And this lets you stay on the cutting edge of what's available, especially in accelerated computing. A lot of the stuff I'm gonna mention, I, I'm gonna show it on small single node or, or short, small node numbers, but it scales out. So these compilers, libraries, tools, profilers, debuggers, they're all tightly integrated with multi-node communication libraries for MPI, Shmem, Nickel, uh, NVShmem, GPU accelerated communication libraries. All of that comes together bundled in a single solution. Now what makes this really portable is that all of these tools, all of these compilers and libraries function equally well on ARM, x86, or PowerPC CPUs with or without GPUs. I can have a Graviton2 instance, and I can build the same code as I might on something like a G5G instance, or a V100 GPU hosted by an x86 CPU. There's all different types of hardware combinations that you can match up and, and, and target with your application if your application is built with this SDK. This is what enables the portability. And best of all, it's completely free. There is no cost to using this. You can go download it into your favorite instance type and just use it. I mean, by the time I'm done with this talk, you could, you could do that. It's completely free. You can, of course, work with NVIDIA for support if that's what you'd like to do, but there's no cost to using this SDK and all the things that come with it. And I really want to emphasize that ARM support has been in the HPC SDK for several years now. This is as much a CPU product as it is a GPU product. You can absolutely target CPU-only solutions using the NVIDIA HPC SDK. And for so many people, this is such a surprise. They think NVIDIA equals GPU. And while NVIDIA makes the best GPUs, undoubtedly, they do also make CPUs. I have to say that. Um, but seriously, you could use this HPC SDK on a, an instance that has no GPU and get really good performance. You can target those CPUs using standard language parallelism, C++ or Fortran, Python, whatever your favorite language might be there. And you can use directive-based parallelization like OpenACC and OpenMP, again, to target the CPU, not necessarily the GPU. We also support vector intrinsics and assembly language. So if you really want to get very specialized in your code, you can using the same compiler. Um, for instance, Graviton2 implements ARM's NEON SV, uh, SMD ISA, whereas the Graviton3 implements both NEON and the scalable vector extension, SVE. Both are good options, they're highly performant, and you can use intrinsics to target either one or you can let the compiler auto-vectorize as appropriate. The whole thing is fully supported um, by the NVIDIA HPC SDK. If you wanna see more details around how NVIDIA HPC SDK supports Graviton3 specifically, go read this technical blog. So this will get into some of the details around auto-vectorizing for the scalable vector extension. 
SVE is really cool. This is the same vector ISA that's found in the Fugaku supercomputer, which topped the top 500 for several years and is still the number one on the green 500. It's the most energy efficient supercomputer on the planet by a large margin. It looks really good. And a large part of that comes from the SVE units that are in Fugaku. That same vector ISA is found in the Graviton 3, which means Graviton 3, and you'll see some numbers to back this up in a minute, is a really beefy CPU. It actually has excellent price performance and excellent single thread performance. And so you can really optimize for that platform using the NVIDIA compiler, as well as open source compilers or others. But the NVIDIA compiler especially targets Graviton 3. So we get performance from the NVIDIA compiler, but it's also very portable. The NVIDIA compiler can target GPU instances. You can use accelerators uh, through directive-based programming or through standard language parallelism. Standard language parallelism is cool enough. I've got a whole section about it in a minute. But essentially, you can run the same code on the CPU or the GPU and let the compiler figure out the difference between the parallelism in the hardware and the, soft, in, in the different uh, CPU and GPU hardware. In addition to being portable across CPUs and GPUs, the compiler supports x86, ARM, and power, as I've said. But it, it doesn't just support them in the sense that, OK, yeah, your code runs. We actually have teams that are tuning for these platforms. We care about the performance of the CPU side of your equation. Why? Because so many accelerated applications, after you accelerate 90% of the code, you know, you still have this problem that there's that 10%. And the faster and faster the 90% gets, the longer the 10% takes in terms of, in relative terms. And so eventually, you really have to optimize on the CPU as well as the GPU, as well as communication between them. And this is one way that we address, address that problem. We optimize for ARM, x86, and power in our compilers as much as we possibly can. This means that you have a free vendor-supported compiler on AWS that can target just about any CPU instance you choose. And that's a very powerful tool. Now, this compiler is very advanced in terms of features. It enables three broad classes of programming models with exactly the same command line, more or less. You have accelerated standard languages, which are ISO standard languages like C++ and Fortran where at a very high level, you don't just describe your algorithm, but you actually describe a parallel algorithm. In C++, you'd use the standard transform with this par argument. Or in Fortran, you use the, the do concurrent keywords. This standard language parallelism is taken by the compiler, and the compiler understands the parallel algorithm and generates parallelized code, or parallelized code, excuse me, for the CPU or the GPU. And as you'll see in a minute, it actually does really good on performance. So this creates a highly portable, abstract, high-level program that is portable across different CPU architectures and GPUs. Now, at times, you might want to take a little bit, of, a little bit more control over your application and maybe explicitly move some data or declare regions of parallelism in ways that, uh, that with standard languages, you, know, you, you need a little bit more. And with that, you can, use, you can incrementally add directives from OpenACC or OpenMP to declare data structures that should be resident on the GPU, or regions of parallelism where restructuring that entire region in standard C++ might have been you know, more than you wanted to do that day. And this combination of standard language parallelism with directive-based parallelism is really powerful. If you're writing a new code from scratch and you write it in standard language parallelism right from the start, you now have an option to further tune and optimize and improve the performance of that code just by adding a few simple lines of OpenMP or OpenACC. And the compiler will just take care of it. You don't have to worry about you know, combining these or will I get weird effects from having threads and processes and stuff. Like, Just don't worry about it. That's the compiler's job. You can do this. And of course, if you really want to get fully platform specialized, you go right as low as you can. Of course, you can, you can write in CUDA. That's a great thing to do. You can write in assembly language. You can write in vector intrinsics. You know, if that's what you want to do, the compiler will support it. And you can absolutely go there. And this is the approach. I, I show you these three programming models, not just as a, you know, you probably should do this. But actually, this is how NVIDIA's own software teams work. The libraries that we provide for the CPUs, the GPUs, our math libraries, even our quantum computing libraries and AI libraries, they follow this design principle. This is what we are doing in-house to build our codes. We're following standard language parallelism, 
incremental portable optimization, and platform spe specialization as needed. Now, I want to take a closer look. How exactly does standard language parallelism work? Can you really have the same code run on a CPU or a GPU without any modification? The way this works is we have worked with the standard language committees, the C++ committee, the Fortran committee, and not just NVIDIA, but many vendors are doing this, to define a language which is high level and understands parallel algorithms. So you, the programmer, you're not coding for a GPU. You're not coding for a CPU. You're coding a parallel algorithm. The CPU then does the translation. With the NVIDIA HPC compiler, you use the dash STDPAR stdpar flag, and you can specify stdpar equals multicore or stdpar equals GPU. When you recompile this code, the exact same code will get recompiled for the CPU or the GPU. Now, the implement de implementation details of that are not really specified. It might be OpenACC under the hood. It might be OpenMP. It might be MPI. It might be some other specialized library you don't know, and you don't have to care. You just know that you wrote a parallel algorithm, and now it runs on a CPU or a GPU. Think about what that means in a cloud environment. AWS has something like 500 instance types or more. And if you have one compiler that can target three different CPU architectures with or without GPUs, that unlocks a huge number of these instances that you could target with the same code base. You don't have to think, oh, I'm, you know, I'm on x86 with a V100, I've got to do it this way. You can write at a very high level and let the software target the hardware in the best possible way. This is how we unlock portability, performance, and productivity, by letting the compiler do the work and you code at a high level. So let's take a look at how this actually works in some application codes. On one side here, I'm showing the Maya CPU app, uh, C++ application. And first, I'm going to run this compiling with the GCC compiler and OpenMP. Now, one thing we've seen actually quite frequently is that when you take a code and you translate it from old C++ with OpenMP to the modern standard language parallelism, and the same is true for Fortran, rewriting that code in the newer language and taking advantage of the new features that are there actually unlocks performance. And so just by modernizing the code, you get significant speed ups. We usually see between 2 and 10x, something like that. Exact same hardware. We're not changing the algorithm. We're not doing anything different. We're just rewriting it to take advantage of the new language features. So the two purple bars here, I've actually used GCC twice. I haven't even used the NVIDIA compiler yet. I'm using the standard language parallelism implemented by another compiler. And I'm seeing a significant speed up on this AMD CPU. Now I recompile that standard language parallelism, again, targeting the CPU, and I get almost 8x speed up versus my original OpenMP code. I haven't even started with GPUs yet. I've just rewritten it to take advantage of the latest language features and used a performant vendor compiler. That's all I've done. Well, now I have this code that's at a high level. It's a portable, uh, it's a portable parallel algorithm. Now I just recompile it for an A100 GPU. And all I do is I add that com command line option, stdpar equals GPU. Right away, the same code goes from being 1x to 60x faster. And this is because we're taking full advantage of the GPU hardware, the advanced language features, and the, ve the vendor compiler all together. So compared to the original GCC with OpenMP, we're 60x faster using the NVIDIA HPC compiler and an A100 GPU hosted by this AMD CPU. Now, the same is true for Fortran. Maya is a C++ code. Fortran is very, very important in the HPC world. And the weather community, of course, they use this stuff all the time. It, it is a key language. And it is a modern language. Uh, I like to joke about Fortran because it always gets a rise out of the Fortran community. But I like Fortran a lot, to tell you the truth. And it is really pretty cool when you start writing these high-level languages because they're so elegant and so clean. Just saying do concurrent in your Fortran code, you have described a parallel algorithm. So here's an example of using the NWChem application, where we start with standard Fortran running a dual socket Xeon 6148 CPU. So two CPUs, 40 cores. We rewrite that to standard language parallel Fortran and run it on an A100 GPU. Speed up goes to 20x. 
again, combination of GPU with the NVIDIA HPC compiler and using the latest language features. Now, for reference, I've included the OpenACC version of this code because you might ask yourself, how, am I paying a performance penalty? I have a code now that runs on a CPU or a GPU. The OpenACC version I'm showing you here was written by OpenACC experts, application experts. These guys know what they're doing. There's every reason to believe that that OpenACC bar is the best the code can do. But you'll see the standard language parallelism actually is slightly higher. It's either matching or beating what the experts are doing by working really hard and using OpenACC. So this is, a, again, a way to emphasize that you are improving on your productivity by taking advantage of standard language parallelism and the NVIDIA HPC compiler. OK, so that's compilers. Remember, we're looking at the whole SDK here, everything that comes with the SDK, including math libraries and communication libraries. So let's take a look at some of the math libraries that we bundle with our compilers, not just bundle, but actually integrate. These are, are tightly integrated with the whole HPC SDK. We support math libraries for linear algebra, fast Fourier transform, random number generators, and basic math functions, as well as tensor math. Tensor math is kind of a big deal. So our Kublas library targets GPUs. This one only runs on the, on the GPU, but the CPU can be x86 ARM or power. So whatever your CPU architecture is, I don't really care, but this code is running on the GPU. And it does full BLAS level one, two, three, and the really interesting thing about these libraries is, okay, so let's say you use this BLAS library and it performs well. That's great. But NVIDIA is constantly investing in its own software. We aren't just shipping it and then, you know, bug fixing. We're actually tuning over time. So what I'm showing in this chart is a speed up chart. And my baseline is actually one generation versus the next. So I'm looking at version 11.1 .1 of the CUDA toolkit, which includes this Kublas versus the next generation of the same library. And you can see that in these kernels, we've, exceed, we've gone between something like 1.5 to 7x faster in those kernels. What this means is if you use the NVIDIA HPC SDK and you link against these math libraries, your code gets faster over time. It's like the opposite of bit rot. You actually get faster over time as the HPC SDK upgrades. And the APIs don't change, it just gets faster. So you're winding up with better performance by using the math libraries in addition to the basic functionality. We also provide sparse math libraries. Sparse counts for a lot, and we have fully GPU-accelerated sparse math libraries. These sparse libraries can combine dense structures as well. So for instance, I can do a sparse vector versus a dense vector, or a dense matrix versus a sparse matrix, or all sparse. All dense would be Kublas, like I just saw. And again, I'm showing you generational speed up in the sparse library. Now, I want to convince you that I'm not just showing you generational speed up in the three kernels that we decided to generate for this chart. We actually optimize across all the kernels that we, we can in a given release time. Prioritizing, of course, but we do try to invest in making these really fast. So these are S-curves comparing the generational performance of two versions of the sparse library. And I'm showing you that for every one of these dots, which is a, a different kernel, um, we're getting pretty significant speed up generation over generation for each kernel. Some of these are going much faster, in fact. Sparse libraries, dense libraries, solver libraries, like Linpack, right? So this is LU, Cholesky, uh, QR composition. Um, now, the cool thing about these is they don't just work on a single node. These are actually integrated with MPI libraries to scale out over multiple nodes. What that means is I can install the NVIDIA HPC SDK on my local you know, x86 notebook or my Apple notebook or whatever, and I can develop my application at a small scale linking against these libraries, and then I can move that to the cloud, pick whatever instance I like, and scale that out, and using the same calls to the KuSolver library, as I was using on my laptop, I can scale out to target multiple instances over something like EFA. So there's a powerful development strategy here. Use the HPC SDK at a small scale, pick your instance type, scale up, and whatever your solver is, whatever numerical method you're using, it comes along for the ride. Fast Fourier transform, this one's everywhere. Um, I really like this chart for two reasons. So this chart shows speed up in FFT sizes. The horizontal axis is different sizes of FFT. The vertical axis is speed up, again, generation versus generation. 
we have one, two, and three dimensional FFT. And what this chart is showing you first is that yes, generation over generation, we're improving performance, things are always getting faster, that's great. But you'll notice there's no, no clusters. We've, in, we've improved all the FFTs across all the sizes. And this is important because it, it often happens that an optimized math library will have sort of performance pit traps, right? If you use the wrong sized FFT, that one hasn't been optimized yet. And so you fall back to a, a slower implementation. In this case, we try to avoid those performance pit traps as much as we can, optimize all the kernels, and so you don't have to think about, you know, bumping your FFT size in one direction or the other. You just work for the application, whatever it needs from your FFT. Random number generators, um, again, pretty much the same story as before. So I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead right to tensor math because this is actually really fun. Um, NVIDIA GPUs have these very powerful tensor cores in them. And the first time I accidentally turned one on using a math library, I thought I'd forgotten how to do basic math because my application, and I'm not making this up, I wasn't even working for NVIDIA at the time, my application was running about 10x faster than I thought was possible. And I wrote the application. I assumed that surely I'd made a mistake someplace, but no, what had happened is I'd activated the tensor cores and I really was getting that 10x speed up. So this Ku tensor library can be really powerful. If you're using any kind of um, tensor math, doing any kind of tensor contractions, this is a great way to get a drop-in acceleration for those. And again, it scales up over multiple nodes, over MPI, Nickel, and MVSHMAM, and so on. In the chart here, the um, sort of orangey, reddish line at the bottom is the previous generation. The green dots are the generational speed-ups in Ku sparse, or excuse me, in Ku tensor. Now, all this is GPU library. All this Ku stuff runs on the GPU. So if you're on a CPU and you're using the NVIDIA HPC SDK, you're falling back to something like an OpenBlaz, which is actually shipped with HPC SDK. You still have an option there. But we want to take it a step farther. We actually want to take this type of acceleration to the CPU. NVIDIA is making a CPU called Grace. And we make the CPU in two products, the Grace Hopper Superchip and the Grace CPU Superchip. Grace Hopper is, as you see here, a CPU and a GPU on the same large, uh, large module. Grace CPU Superchip is CPU only. There's no GPU available at all. It is purely a CPU solution. And so we are bringing the same math libraries to ARM CPUs. And this will be coming out in the middle of next year. Now, this should be very exciting for anybody who's using the AWS Graviton. Graviton 2 and Graviton 3 are supported by HPC SDK, but Graviton 3 is actually very interestingly similar to NVIDIA Grace. They're not the same CPU, they're not the same core, I have to say that, but they share a lot of architectural features, which means that we port software to Graviton 3 in preparation for supporting Grace. And that means the math libraries we're building are already being tested on Graviton 3 today. When these math libraries launch for Grace, they will support Graviton 3 almost as a, as a waypoint in supporting Grace. And so you're going to get optimized, vendor-supported BLAS, FFTs, LAPAC, all the great stuff I've shown you on the previous slides that were for GPU only, you're going to get them for ARM CPUs in AWS as well as wherever else you might get NVIDIA Grace. All right. So that's a brief overview of the NVIDIA HPC SDK. We looked at compilers, looked at math libraries. I didn't really touch on tools. Um, if you have any questions about profilers and debuggers, we can cover those. Um, but I really wanted to focus on the more uh, performance-focused, portability-focused part of this, the debugging and profiling. That's another talk. We could do that sometime. But let's look at what happens when I actually use this in the cloud. Maybe. All right. Oh, so. You want to go use this thing in the cloud. How do you do it? Well, there's a couple of ways you can get the NVIDIA HPC SDK. The first is it's available in the marketplace. You can go to AWS Marketplace. You can grab an optimized AMI that already has CUDA and the HPC SDK installed for you. Um, it's intended for x86 CPUs. You can go just spin it up, fire it off. It works great. A more flexible option that will let you install on any AWS instance that has the right CPU or GPU um, is to just install it yourself. If you go to developer nvidia.com slash HPC SDK, 
you can download and install this using the instructions that are provided there. There's just a couple of, of lines of terminal code. You just copy and paste those. It takes care of it for you. This is really easy and really fast. In fact, let's see here. I have a demonstration of it right here. So I've just spun up an AWS Graviton 3 instance. This instance has been alive for all of about 16 seconds. And I'm just copying and pasting the commands I pulled from the developer nvidia.com slash HPC SDK website. And what you can see is I've added a new repo, and I'm starting to install packages from that repo. Some of the packages coming in include supporting compilers like GCC, GFortran. Those are things that we just need you know, to include the, the broad set of, of capabilities that are in NVIDIA HPC SDK. But alongside those basic requirements, we're pulling in the whole of the NVIDIA compilers, libraries, communication libraries, all this stuff, and it's getting installed for me. Because it comes all in one and fully integrated, by the time this installation is done, I will have a complete development environment where I could do HPC development on a CPU or a GPU without any further steps. That's it. In fact, by the time I'm done talking about this slide, it's done. Here we are. We've got the NVIDIA HPC SDK installed. I can use the uh, environment modules tool to manage some environment modules and load the compiler module. And once I've done this, if we just look for some compilers, like the NVC++ compiler, there it is. I've got it. I've also got an NV Fortran compiler. Um, and ooh, that went back too fast. But the last thing there was the MPI run command demonstrating that the whole MPI environment has already been set up for me. Now this is pretty cool if you're gonna be using something like MPI over EFA and you just wanna get it done. You don't wanna to think too hard about your environment, just go install it. So after I've gone and installed this, I wanted to test it out. My methodology here is I took this app, this mini weather app, and I built it in as many different ways as I possibly could for as many different AWS instances as I possibly could. MiniWeather is a great tool for this because it, it involves both C++ and Fortran, but it solves a semi-realistic problem. We're not just you know, doing gem or, or stream or something, which those are useful, but they're not as interesting. Um, it's also part of the spec HPC benchmark, so doing well here is certainly not a bad thing. And it's also open source and frequently used in training events, so it's familiar. So you might be able to relate to these results. Now, MiniWeather, has different parallelization strategies inside the same code base. You can use MPI, you can use OpenMP, you can use OpenACC, and you can use standard language parallelism. If you're using the stood part implementation of, of, of MiniWeather, you're using Fortran, the do concurrent directive, as you, as you see here. Um, oh yes, of course, it also supports target offload with, with OpenMP. So this gives me, if you think about it for a moment, I've got one SDK that can target a lot of different types of hardware and one application that can target a lot of different programming methodologies. I can sweep all those combinations and figure out which hardware maps best to which methodology to give me the best performance for this mini app, which is exactly what I did. So I went and I ran this for MPI, for OpenMP, for OpenACC, and for standard language parallelism, again, using only the stuff I installed on that previous slide. I'm just using the compiler, that, you know, apt install NVIDIA HPC SDK, basically. And what I'm getting from this is different times for different programming methodologies on different hardware. I then take the best time for each one and put it on this slide. So you've got here, mostly OpenACC, actually. It tended to be the winner, with standard language parallelism a close second, and MPI usually third. My baseline in this case is the C6i instance, which uses an Intel Ice Lake CPU, and then I compile on the HPC 6a instance with the AMD Epic CPU, the C7g with a Graviton 3 CPU, the C6g with a Graviton 2 CPU, and then I get onto the GPU instances, which I'll talk about in a minute. First thing to point out is on the CPU side, the Graviton instances are showing very strong. Remember, we're up against an ice lake here. Graviton 3 is posting 1.45x total speed up and 1.7x just about price performance advantage versus the ice lake. So if you were gonna run weather code, the Graviton 3 is not a bad option, especially when you're using NVIDIA compiler. Graviton 2 is holding its own against the ice lake but the GPU instances are where things get really interesting. Because I have this SDK that can target different types of hardware, I can just throw it at it and see what happens, 
And here, the best overall performance is coming from the NVIDIA V100 GPU. Now, this code is predominantly performance bound by the GPU. Having a big GPU helps a lot. So you see that performance scales pretty directly with GPU capability. Bigger GPU, faster code. But price performance is also pretty fascinating here. If you look, the G5G instance, which is a Graviton 2 CPU with a T4G GPU, is showing the best overall price performance, almost actually matching the price performance of the uh, V100 GPU, slightly less. This is telling me that if what I really cared about was just the cost of the simulation, and I had infinite time, the ARM-hosted GPU would probably be my best option by a slight margin. But really, for absolute overall performance, I want as big of a GPU as I can possibly get. So I just go for the V100. Now, you can run mini apps like this for your application. I'm doing a weather simulation here, but the methodology is the same. Use a mini app, scatter it over a bunch of different instances using the HPC SDK, and if you're using standard language parallelism, this gets even simpler, and then just figure out what hardware maps best to your application and go with that. And you just code to the platform and leave the hardware details up to the hardware. Now, I mentioned that OpenACC was usually the fastest on that chart with Studpar as close second. I want to show you how close a close second it was. Because remember, if I code in this, this uh, standard uh, language parallelism, that code runs completely without modification on all the different hardware. And so you might think I'm leaving a lot of performance behind, but really you're not. In three out of four of these cases, the difference between OpenACC and standard language parallelism was largely academic. We're, we're well less than 10% here. In fact, the P3 case with the x86 hosted V100, that 20% overhead, I can, I can make it go away by adding a single line of OpenACC to help move some data to the GPU ahead of a kernel. So that second approach of write in standard language parallelism and then optimize with directive-based programming would pay off here. You could use that and actually just use standard language parallelism for all instances and leave the directive-based parallelism behind. Take another example. So that was Fortran with MiniWeather. How about C++? Lulesh is an interesting application. This is a hydrodynamics mini app from Lawrence Livermore. And in this case, it was rewritten from OpenMP with C++ to just standard language parallelism. Now, the final code, and I want to emphasize this, it compiles with the NVIDIA compiler, GCC, Intel compiler, even the MSVC compiler can build this code. This is not vendor-specific magic I'm talking about here. This is standard language parallelism. It works on all standard compilers. And so the resulting code, in addition to being parallel, parallel, uh, it was actually a lot smaller, cleaner, easier to read, easier to maintain. And the baseline performance of that new code was up by about 2x. So once we have this standard language parallel version of Lulesh, again, run it on all the instances using the HPC SDK as our common denominator. Now, there's some interesting similarities and differences to what we saw with MiniWeather. First, again, I'm using the Ice Lake instance as my baseline, the C6i. Um, performance is pretty good on the, AD, the AMD instance, a little less. Uh, performance is pretty good on the, on the Graviton 3, a little bit better. So Graviton, again, showing really strongly. Graviton 2, not so much as, as a Graviton 3. Now, in the GPU area, I was surprised to see that once I added a GPU, I didn't get that much speed up. And the reason for this is the Lulesh mini app calls a lot of little accelerated kernels. It's always rushing back and forth between the CPU and the GPU, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And that means that in this case, having a huge V100 GPU doesn't buy me a lot. It really needs a combination of CPU, GPU, and the interconnect between them to be fully optimized. So in this case, if I'm just optimizing for raw performance, I actually got the best performance from a T4 GPU hosted by an AMD CPU. Why? Because that's a very balanced platform. We're getting a really good high-speed connection between the CPU and the GPU. The CPU is quite capable, and the GPU is quite capable, or capable enough, at least for this application and its small kernels. So just throwing the biggest GPU you can at a GPU-accelerated application, not always the right answer. And if you were to use the AMD-hosted T4 GPU, you get like a 3x speed up and something like a 8x price performance. Now, interestingly, if you can sacrifice a little bit of performance on the CPU side and step down to a Graviton 2 CPU, 
you get a much better price performance. Again, because we're getting enough lift from the GPU to accelerate us overall that we can ease back a little bit on the GPU and take that much cheaper CPU. And the net effect is we get the ARM-hosted GPU is something like 11 half x what the Ice Lake instance was in terms of price performance. What this is coming down to is, you know, spoiler alert, look forward to Grace Hopper, because <laughs> that's going to be a very interesting platform. All right. Check my time here. Oh, I'm looking pretty good. So just to recap this, and then I'll leave some time for questions. If you want to get started with the HPC SDK, go to developernvidia.com, HPC SDK, or find it on the AWS Marketplace. It is completely free. It's completely available to use. No licenses, no sign up. Just go click the download link, go read the installation instructions, and copy and paste them into your terminal. That's all it takes. It enables productivity because it supports programming models that are highly productive, like standard language parallelism. And it actually supports whatever programming model you might need. If you need directive-based parallelism, like OpenACC or OpenMP, it works. If you need CUDA or assembly language or intrinsics, it works. It is performant. It's constantly optimized. We're constantly making compilers and the libraries faster, generation over generation. Your code gets faster. If you build on this platform, you have flexibility in the hardware, but you also, over time, on the same hardware, get better performance. And it's portable. We target x86, ARM, open, open power, with or without a GPU. So you have a lot of choice, and that really unlocks all the different options you get in the cloud. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attention. Are there any questions?